Has anyone ever said to you, <clears throat> if you love me, then... And that statement is typically followed by a, a specific request for you to prove your love. I want you to think about that statement for just a moment. If you happen to be the one who was saying, if you love me, what did you want from the other person? Or if someone said it to you, what was it that they wanted? Maybe you've never made that statement, if you love me, or maybe no one has ever said that statement to you. But either way, I want to just share a few examples of how that might play out. You see, a wife could say to her husband, if you love me, you will put away the groceries, or take me out to dinner, or buy me a new blank, and you can fill in the blank, but it better be expensive. Uh, a husband might say to his wife, if you love me, you will take care of my desires. Or let me go fishing with the boys this weekend. Or if you love me, you will be more like some other woman. Not a wise request. A teen could say to their parents, if you love me, give me $20. If you love me, you will buy me a car. Or let me stay out past my curfew. And finally, a parent might say to their child, if you loved me, you would clean your room or not complain whenever I ask you to do something. Or if you loved me, you would visit me or you would call me or you would at least talk to me. Now, as you can see, this if you love me line can kind of be manipulative. It can be used to get someone to prove their love when many times they've already done so. And yet, Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me. In fact, he said it four times in the passage from John 14 that we just read. Now, when Jesus said, if you love me, he was not being manipulative. Jesus wasn't suggesting that in return we had to earn his love. He wasn't advocating works righteousness, the idea that we're made right with God by doing certain things or being a good person. Jesus wasn't even suggesting that we were going to repay his debt, our debt to him for his offering us grace and forgiveness. And that'd be impossible anyway. And so the question is, what was Jesus asking when he said, if you love me? But we'll get into that in a few minutes. But first, I want to kind of give us a little bit of a refresher this morning. Before we took a break for Christmas, way back at the end of, thanks, of uh, November, we were just a little past the halfway point in our study of John's Gospel. Over the previous ten months, we had talked about Jesus' miracles, turning water into wine, the healing of an official son, the healing of a man at the pool of Bethesda, walking on water, feeding the 5,000, restoring the sight of a man born blind, and raising Lazarus from the dead. And in John's Gospel, if you look at it, there are seven signs, seven of the miracles that Jesus performed out of the many, but seven of them are described in this Gospel. And these signs were evidence of Jesus' deity. Over those past few months, we've awful, we've awful, we have also looked at Jesus' claims. Jesus said we had to be born again. Jesus stated that he was one with the Father. He spoke of his being the bread of life, the giver of eternal life, the light of the world, and the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus said no one comes to the Father except through him. And every one of those claims Jesus made are true. The religious leaders, though, didn't like Jesus, and they didn't like the popularity he was gaining, and so opposition was starting to mount against him. The Pharisees and the chief priests sought to kill Jesus. Then in John chapter 12, we read about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. And the remaining chapters of John's gospel examine Jesus' final days on earth his last teachings, his betrayal and trial in the cross, and his resurrection. 
And included in these last chapters is something we call Jesus' farewell discourse. Jesus' disciples were greatly troubled at the news that he was going to be leaving them. They didn't fully understand what was going on. And so Jesus taught them. He focused on building the new messianic community, the Christian community. Jesus prepared his disciples to spread the gospel. In his farewell discourse, Jesus t challenged the disciples while also providing encouragement and assurance for the troubling days that were coming. And Jesus' words are certainly, certainly relevant today. We live in uncertain times. Our hearts are often deeply troubled. In John 14, 15 through 31, Jesus challenges us to live a life of obedience. He also provides much needed encouragement and assurance. And so we're going to start this morning with the challenge. And the challenge comes from a very simple truth, and that is that love leads to obedience. Love leads to obedience. Four times in John 14, 15 through 31, Jesus states, if you love me. In verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In verse 21, we read, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Then in verse 23, Jesus states, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And then finally, in verse 28, we read, if you loved me, you would have rejoiced. Now, it's important that as we read Jesus' words today, we remember that he's already demonstrated his love for us on the cross. His love is freely given to all who receive him, who put their trust in him. We don't earn it. We don't repay it. Still, Jesus' love for us requires a response. Our love for Jesus in return is shown in our attitude, our words, and in our actions. Imagine for a moment a, a young man and his, his girlfriend. And they've been together for quite a while now. And he has fallen deeply in love with her. He wants to spend the rest of, her li rest of his life with her. And yet, he's apprehensive about declaring his love to her verbally. What if she doesn't love him? Finally, at what he feels is just the right time, he musters the courage to say, I love you. His girl looks at him without smiling or saying a word. There's silence. No response. No commitment. And then after the awkward silence, she quickly changes the subject. Now put yourself in that young man's place. His, he is heartbroken. And that's because love demands, it requires a response. Jesus' love for us demands a response as well. And part of that response is our obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will keep my word and you would have rejoiced. And all of those are tied to our obedience. Now, you might wonder about when he says you would have rejoiced. Well, the disciples rejoicing actually is an example of obedience. Jesus said if the disciples loved him, they would have rejoiced in his talking about completing his mission and returning to the Father. If his disciples would have really understood Jesus' mission to go to the cross, they would have realized that it was a reason for them to have joy. His mission was to save us. But there's even more to it than that. The disciples would have rejoiced for Jesus, for celebrating what he was thrilled about. Obedience means that we don't live for me, we live for thee. We live for Jesus. And since we love Jesus, we follow his commands. Love and obedience go together. If a child loves her parents, most of the time she'll obey them. If a man loves a woman, he will seek to live with her in harmony. There will be a mutual submission, a mutual obedience. And in a similar way, 
love and obeying God's law, his commands, go together. And in our world today, you know, people, we, we get the love part. It's easy to focus on the truth that God is love. He is. But the fact of the matter is if we love God, we will obey God. And obedience does require effort. But it also provides a great joy. To be aligned with God's will, to be obedient to his commands, is to live a life that's filled with purpose. It's a life that has meaning. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, okay, that sounds great. What am I supposed to do? How do I obey Jesus? One thing I've learned over the years is we make understanding Jesus' commands often more complicated than it needs to be. Remember when Jesus summarized all of God's command into two? Love God, love people. To love God is to make him our number one priority. The Bible is our authority. We worship God with our time and our talents and our treasure. And that means we give God our life. We live for Christ. We make time for God every single day. We use the talents that God has given us to do good, to bring glory to God. And we give of our money, we give of our treasure to support God's work, whether it be in the church or in mission. And if we love God, we'll also love people. Richard Phillips says to love people is to serve, to sacrifice, and to share. We serve others. We put the needs of others ahead of our own. We not only serve, we sacrifice. We give of ourselves even when it isn't comfortable, even when it isn't easy. And we share. We share the blessings that God has given us with other people. The call to loving obedience can make us feel a little uncomfortable. We've probably all been there. We love Jesus. We love him deeply. But we don't always obey Jesus. And I think that's true for every one of us. And and some have questioned. They say, you know what, well, if I struggle with sin, if I fail, does that mean that I don't love Jesus? And the answer to that is no. The, the point is if we struggle, if we fight against our temptation to sin, it proves we do love Jesus even though sometimes we fail. But the difficult news that follows that is this. If we have no desire to obey Jesus' commands, if our life is a- absence from any evidence of living for Christ, well, guess what? It shows then we don't really love Jesus. We don't belong to him. But on the other side, if we exhibit loving obedience, we actually experience blessings. The joy of obedience. See, loving obedience is blessed by the Holy Spirit. Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit. Christians have the Holy Spirit living in them. You don't have to do anything. Be a Christian. You have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third person of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three in one. Three persons. One God. John 14, 15 through 7 says this. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. And then in verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him, and we will make our home in him. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He makes our, his home in our heart. Now, now, the Greek word that's translated as helper in this passage is actually a word called paraclete. And paraclete is a very rich word. It's been translated as advocate or helper. The paraclete, the Holy Spirit, is the one who comes alongside us. He lives in us to guide and protect and empower us. When our oldest son, Brett, was learning to to ride a bike, I took him up to a track at the nearby middle school. And I, and I, 
Thought it was a great and safe place to learn to ride a, b- a bike. No cars, no traffic. And Brett was doing really well. And I was running alongside of him to make sure that he was okay. But then Brett sped up. And I couldn't keep up. And the track curved. And Brett went straight. Straight down a steep hill and into a fence. He was pretty banged up. But nothing was broken. And I felt terrible because I had failed in keeping him on track. See, the Holy Spirit, in a, in a way, kind of runs alongside us throughout our life. But he won't fall behind. He'll be with us to keep us on track if we listen to him. And life isn't easy, but it's not because the Holy Spirit's abandoned us. In our, our passage, Jesus mentions several of the things that the Holy Spirit does. First, he lives within us. We know him. He's our friend. Jesus said the world doesn't see the Spirit and doesn't know the Spirit. And that's because when Jesus talks about the world there, that's the people who have rejected him. In verse 18, Jesus said he would not leave us as orphans. He would come to us. Orphans in Jesus' time were destitute. Their future was bleak. But God adopts us into his family. We are his children. Our inheritance is heaven. And when Jesus said in this passage that he would come to us, it can actually have three meanings. Jesus was talking to the disciples and he would come back to his disciples after the resurrection. Jesus will come to us in his second coming. And Jesus comes to us through the Holy Spirit. And all are true. And all provide encouragement. The Spirit teaches us the truth of God. He reminded the disciples of Jesus' words. The Spirit reminds you and I what God has done for us. He opens our eyes to God's word, the Bible. Verse 26 reads, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I have said to you. What words of encouragement. The Holy Spirit, though, also offers us peace. In verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let your hearts not be troubled. Let them not be afraid. And Jesus was there telling us, we're never going to be abandoned. And that's something at that time the disciples needed to hear. Jesus was leaving them soon to go die on the cross, and they were troubled. Peace probably seemed very distant. Fear was growing. And Jesus encouraged his disciples by speaking of his gift of peace. It's kind of like a mother talking to her young daughter. The girl has perhaps experienced some form of trauma. Maybe a friend has betrayed her. Maybe she's afraid because she's going to a new school and won't know anyone. It could be that a, a grandparent has recently passed away. The girl is afraid. She feels alone. She might feel even as if she's been abandoned. But her mom reassures her. She says, I'm with you. You have friends and family who love you. It's going to be okay. And that's what Jesus was telling his disciples and us. I will always be with you. I love you. It's going to be okay. Jesus' peace offering also has to do with his restoring our peace with God. Without Jesus, we're God's enemies. We're rebellious, we sin against God, and we can't fix it. Jesus came to restore that relationship with God. Jesus offers us forgiveness through his blood on the cross. Jesus' righteousness covers our sins. When God looks at a Christian, he doesn't see our sin, he sees his son's righteousness. Through Christ, we're made right with God. And knowing that provides assurance. Our loving obedience is blessed with assurance. Jesus said in verse 19, he said, because I live, you also will live. I, I think about that. That is the ultimate assurance. We have eternal life through Christ. Because he lives, we too will live. Other words of assurance in this passage include verse 16. The Father will give you another helper to be with you forever. 
Verse 18, I will come to you. Verse 27, peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Let your hearts not be troubled. In verse 29, he says, and now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. Kind of strange words there, but what Jesus was doing was helping his followers understand what was coming in just a few days. His trial, his death, his resurrection. Jesus knew the plan. He was letting his disciples knew that he knew the plan. Jesus predicted what was going to happen. And then when it happened, just as he said it would, that would help the belief of the disciples. And not only that, but in that passage there, Jesus indicated that Satan was going to be involved. Evil was going to be involved, but that Satan had no power over Jesus. And that's also good news. And when we think about assurance, there's two passages that always come to my mind. One of them is John 20, 30. It says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And then the second is 1 John 5, 13. John writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. If you believe in the name of the Son of God, if you put your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can know you have eternal life. There's one last blessing in our passage, and it reinforces, it kind of goes back and reinforces our need for loving obedience. In verse 31, Jesus said, I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. I do as the Father commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. See, Jesus himself demonstrated his love for the Father through obedience. And he asked us to do the same. You know, over the past 10 months, we have experienced so many uncertainties, so many of life's troubles. The virus has caused sickness and pain and isolation and death. And sadly, at a time when our nation should be coming together, our nation is divided. Finger pointing is the new national pastime. This past week, we saw another example of lawlessness. Peaceful protesting is our right. And that's what the majority do. But it seems that there's always another element, a, a smaller minority element that breaks the law, destroying property and endangering, endangering lives. And it's wrong, and it was wrong last summer, and it was wrong last week. And, and as Christians, that causes us to mourn. We mourn the troubles of our world. With each passing day, we witness our culture, our nation, seemingly walking further away from Christ. And it's heartbreaking. And it weighs on us. And we might have had times where we wonder, when is it all going to end? When is this virus going to go away? When will people learn to love each other instead of hate each other? When will people learn to work together? Will people ever realize that they need Jesus? You know, I think we have just a, a little taste, a, a very slight very slight understanding of what Jesus' disciples experienced as Jesus was telling them about him going to the cross. They were troubled. We are troubled. We live in troubling times. But like the disciples, we also have hope. When your heart is troubled, look to Jesus. He is our hope. Jesus wins. He always wins. And so to help you this week, if you're struggling with the uncertainties and the troubles and the tensions in our world, this week go back and read the entire chapter of John 14. As you read that chapter, Jesus is going to remind you that he has saved us. We belong to him, and nothing can change that. Jesus will challenge you to live a life of loving obedience. You'll be encouraged to know that the Holy Spirit is walking alongside you to teach you and to guide you. 
You will receive the assurance of belonging to God, adopted children, loved, protected, and saved. You see, because Jesus lives, we have life today and for eternity. Let us pray.